Dr. Samuels, please take the stand. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Did any of you hear or see anything about this case in the media, meaning television, radio, newspapers, the internet, any other form of media? I see no hands. Did anyone attempt to speak to you about this case other than those involved in the trial, including my staff? I see no hands. Mr. Martinez, you may continue with follow-up. Sir, when we last left, we were talking about the PDS and the scoring. Do you remember that? Yes. And uh, one of the things that we discussed was Exhibit 535, which is uh, this exhibit here. And this one has the scores 15 and 33. When was this created? This was created at the time, that, uh, there were two times that I actually calculated this. Once was when I did the original scoring, so that would have been at around the time that I did my evaluation. And the other time was a second time when I didn't have access to my original calculations and for my own purposes, I wanted to recalculate it. And I did, and there was an arithmetic error apparently, and the number is different. But I do want to point something out. Now, sir, my question to you is, when did you create exhibit number 535? As best as you know, when? As best as I know, either at the time that I did my evaluation, which, which if, you, if you need a specific date, I'll give you a date. Here, let me give you an exhibit so that that'll help you out. Uh, how about? Exhibit number 534 says January 15th of 2010, right? That's correct. So you, you either did it on or around January 15th of 2010 or when? Correctly. Or, or, and then I did it a second time. Okay. And um, that may have been up to six months later. I'm not sure. I didn't have access to the original calculations. For my own purposes, I was reviewing my data and I recalculated it, and that would account for the discrepancy in the number. So exhibit 550, the one with the dots in it, was this before exhibit number 535? Which came first? The dots. So if we're looking at it, then this one right here, exhibit number 550 came first, and then we have the scores that are set out there, correct? That's correct. And then for some reason, you decided to rescore it sometime later, right? That's correct. And you decided to rescore it, and as a result of that, you came up with 535, right? That's correct. This rescoring, you, you were trying to say something about this rescoring and that you didn't have something in front of you. When you rescored it, didn't you have exhibit number 534 in front of you? I had the raw data in front of me, yes. Which is 534, right? Right. And isn't that really all that you need to score this test? Yes. And so... You then said that when you rescored it, which is exhibit number 535, that something was missing. What is it that you said was missing? My uh, original worksheet. I didn't have access to it. You didn't have, when you say original worksheet, you're saying 534? 
No. Uh, the original, well, it says it, it's identified as the worksheet. I don't know the, uh, the, the number of the uh, document, but it's, I think, what you're holding in your hand, actually. But isn't this what she provided to you, 534? Yes, that is the raw data. Right. And this is, isn't this what you take and then input into, for example, exhibit not 550, and we'll just use an example of part one, question number one. She said yes, so she hit, there's a circle there for the yes, right? Yes. So what is it that you didn't have that you need needed for exhibit 535? That is what you're holding in your hand. Right. The earlier version is what I did not have. You didn't have... I didn't have it in my hand at the time that I was evaluating, re-scoring that particular You test. didn't have Exhibit 550 in your hand? Well, I don't, I don't know what 550 is, sir. Could you bring it to me? Sure. And I'll... That, I had 550 in my hand. Ah, but there are, there are two forms connected to this. Let me have it back. Did you have 550 in your hand along with 534 at the time that you rescored this as I had reflected part, the, hold on, as reflected in 535? I had part of one of those exhibits in my hands. Well, you definitely had 534, right? I'm not sure I had that one with me either. I know that I had the summary score sheet that has the circles filled in that I had with me. I don't know that I carry that with me at that time. Sir, why is it that you're going about and rescoring something, which is number 535, without the raw data? Isn't that how it gets transferred over to um, the score sheets by well, using could. the raw data? Yes or no? They can't answer that yes or no, sir. So this isn't used to transfer it over to, as we have in Exhibit 534, 550, I'm sorry, the, the dots. This, that's not what's used. See that? Yes, that that's part of the exhibit that you gave me, and I didn't have the second part of that exhibit, but I had the first part of the exhibit. Just what exhibit? Exhibit 550. Sir, if you have exhibit 534, isn't it just a mechanical um, issue to take what's in 534 and take this score sheet and fill out the little round circles, isn't that? Yes, and I had the sheet with the little round circles. All right, if you had the sheet with the little round circles in it, isn't that all that you needed for filling out 535? Yes. So what is it that was missing then? You keep telling me that something was missing. What was missing? Sir, I'm trying to explain to you. It's pretty simple to me, and maybe I'm not explaining it properly. Maybe you're you. not. Why don't you tell me what was missing? Give me something succinct. The original worksheet, which you have also held up, but I don't know what number it is. 534. No, that's not it. This is not the original worksheet? That's not a worksheet. That's the answer sheet. The worksheet is connected to the answer sheet that has the dots on it. You have two exhibits there connected to one stable. And therefore, I can't separate, I can't talk about one and not the other. All right, well, let's take a look at exhibit 550 so that we'll know what you're talking about. We have the front page, right? Yes. We have the second page, which is the one with the dots on it, right? Correct. The third page also has some dots on it, right? That's correct. And we've agreed that from Exhibit 534, you can just transfer the information to the dots, right? That's correct. Then there is an ABC portion of it. Do you see that? Yes. And if we take a look at Exhibit number 535, that's the same thing, ABC, right? Yes. And then if we go to the next and last page, it says DEF, right? Yes. And so we have DEF here, right? Yes. There's nothing else left in Exhibit 550. What worksheet are you talking about? I'm talking about the worksheet that, sir, I'm trying to explain to you. You have two separate documents stapled Absolutely. together with the same number. And so I'm trying to talk about one part of that particular piece of evidence. So are you saying at that time that you did or scored number 535, did you have the front page of 550? Yes, yes sir. Did you have the second page? That is the dots, yes. Did you have the third page? More dots? Yes. 
Did you have the fourth page? No. So what you didn't have was your previous scoring, right? Correct. So what you're saying, so what you're saying then is that you were able to go through your files and you were able to find this first, if you will, one, two, three pages, right? Sure, yes. And because you couldn't find the other two pages, you decided to rescore it. Is that what you're saying? I didn't take this original scoring with me. I was out of town. I had taken some additional material with me to work on in my spare time when I was out of town. I'm, I'm, I did not take the original scoring. I left it back in my office. I'm, but I did have a blank sheet, so I recalculated in a hasty fashion in order to determine whether or not my original scoring was correct. So what you're saying is you didn't have what you originally scored, which is the last two pages of Exhibit 550, right? That is correct. And you decided on a whim or for whatever reason that you wanted to rescore it, which is what we're talking about. It was about. not on a whim, sir. Well, you decided to rescore it even though you already had a result in 550, For right? my own purposes, yes. And I'm entitled to do that, by the way. No one's asking you whether or not you're entitled to do it or not. Why is it that this, then, was separate from the... This exhibit here, which is 535. Because somehow when you picked up my pile of papers on the desk here and took it and placed it into evidence, you also picked up a piece of information that I hadn't disclosed. So what you're saying is it's the prosecutor's fault that exhibit 550 came to light. I'm not saying it was your fault. I'm saying that it was picked up as part of a pile of information I had here and entered into evidence. But if you are somewhere else and you have the file with you, what is the necessity of score? And well, when did you rescore this? Give me a, a date. Probably three or four months after. What is the necessity of rescoring this since you already have an original score? Did you doubt yourself? No, sir. I decided I wanted to recalculate it. That's all. It's my, I, I have the option to do that should I want to do it. I and can score it 10 times if I want to. But, but you decided that you didn't, for whatever reason, when you were out of town, you decided to do it, right? Yes. Where were you? Palm Springs. So why is it that you're taking this individual's um, file or part of the file, and knowing that you don't have the other score with you, you decide to rescore it? Wouldn't it have been helpful to have the previous one so that you could at least compare? Sir, I was away on a weekend vacation. I always take my work with me in the event I have some downtime and I want to work on it. I take my computer. I take selected portions of the file so I'm not carrying around a tremendous amount of material. I had some downtime. I had the raw data. I had a blank form, but I did not have the copy of the form that I had filled out before. Just so that I knew where I was working, going with this, I decided to rescore it. It was not meant to be disclosed. And in fact, the numbers have no relevance whatsoever to my diagnosis and the support of this and test of PTSD. Am I asking you anything about whether or not these numbers are relevant to your uh, finding that or diagnosis of PTSD? I'm not asking you that, am I? No, you're not. Um, so you decided to rescore it, and on one, the later one, you it's uh, the number of the symptoms, you get 15, right? Yes. And on the earlier one, the number of the system, number of symptoms is 17, right? Yes. You got it wrong both times, didn't you? Yep. And in fact, had you rescored it again, you would have found that you would have gotten a third number, right? That's correct, which I have here. Am I asking you if you have it there? No, you're not asking me. So as it turns out, you, you, when you do the first one, which is exhibit number 550, so that we're clear, you got a score of 17, right? Sir, the numbers have nothing to do am with I what I reported. You, if, am I asking you if the numbers are important? Judge, maybe you can refresh the page that you have in your question. Yes. May I answer? Well, wait, For a question. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Sir, I'm not asking you if the numbers are important. I'm just asking you if the numbers match here. No, they do not. They do not match. And so on exhibit 150, you have a 17. And at that time, when you calculated that, you had everything you needed in front of you, right? Yes. You had, you had uh, the raw data, which is in exhibit number 534. And you sat down, and you started to do this hand scoring, right? Yes. You were not pressured by time, right? No. So then when you went on vacation, you decided to rescore it again. At, and then that's 535. And at that time, you said, well, I didn't have all of the data. And so I came up with a score of 15, right? I had all the data. Not the data. 
I'm going to object of the speaking objection issue. Yes, no speaking objections. If you need to make a, an extended objection, please ask to approach. Overruled, you may continue. Sir, so what we're talking about here in exhibit number 535, this is the one that you did when you were on vacation, right? Yep. And this is the one that you're saying that you didn't have all the data, right? No, I had all the data. I did not have the scored sheet, the original hand scored sheet. And I wanted to recalculate it to make certain that the uh, DSM diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder was met, and it was. And even though it was, it looks like what we have here is a situation where you have, if you will, you've done this scoring three times, right? Correct. And the necessity for the scoring of these is these uh, things three times is that you're a little bit sloppy, right? Overruled. Right. I made an arithmetic er, arithmetic error, which does not affect the Am, utility of the test. He's going beyond my question. Overruled. You may finish. Thank you. The diagnostic criteria is met on the first go around of scoring. I tested that component, and each time that I scored it, Ms. Arias met or even exceeded the minimum requirement for a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. The further calculations were dealing with symptom severity, total number of symptoms, and so on. However, I did not report those numbers in my report, as they were irrelevant to my purposes. All I said in my report was, that the scoring of the post-traumatic stress disorder scale supported the original diagnosis which I made based upon my clinical and forensic experience and all the interviews that I conducted, it confirmed the presence of PTSD. All that I was referring to was the first level of scoring, which if you would take a close look at these score sheets, was identical in all three versions. I did not refer to the numbers in my report, and they were not relevant to anything, any conclusion that I made. And so in those 35 years of experience, sir, this is what we get from you. That we get on one score, you get 15, on another you get 17, and then you come here today and finally tell us it's at 16. That's what we get, right? Yes, but as I said, those numbers were not relevant to my analysis. Did I ask you if they were relevant? No, you did not. The other thing, sir, that uh, we have here is that you said that you did the MCA. MCMI-3, do you remember that? Yes. 541, and this is a printout of that, right? Yes. And this is a printout after a computer actually scored it, right? Correct. Sir, did you also rescore this one too? No. Let me show you something then. Overall. Exhibit number 553. See if you recognize it. Well, this is not my printout. This is someone else's printout. Why do you say that's somebody else's printout? Because it has a date up on top, which mine does not print out. Well, sir, are you sure, are you positive that that wasn't attached to a report that was disclosed to the state? I'm quite certain. You I can tell you, well, I can tell you in a minute. Yes. May we have that, please? I don't believe this is mine.
take a look at your report to see whether or not this is part of it. Yes, apparently they've changed the protocol. That is mine. That okay. is from my report. Well, when you say they changed the protocol, you're in charge of the ship, aren't you? No, this is a, a, a commercial scoring service that, they, that I use, and occasionally they change the format. Currently, they're not putting the dates on, so... You, you did say, for example, that uh, this was scored in December of uh, 2009, right? Um, in an answer to a question from the jury. Do you remember that? Yes, it was scored at that time, but this is the date of the administration. And so um, one of them has a date on it and one of them does not, right? Uh, are the two printouts, the two graphs? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. And the reason for, for that is that it was run twice, right? No. Why is it that then this sheet after it's completed and disclosed and presented to us, exhibit number 541, and I'm just looking at the top, that's all I care about is a date. How come that somehow a date magically appears on it? Uh, honestly, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It's not your mistake, it's somebody else's mistake, right? It couldn't be my mistake because that comes off the internet, that's a, a printout, and I can't account for the fact that one had a date and one didn't have a date. Sir, uh, you talked uh, in answer to jurors' questions about your um, diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Yes. And in fact, this morning you addressed it again. You indicated to me that with regard to this PDS, even though there were whatever numbers are there, it doesn't change your diagnosis of PTS, right? Correct. Uh, uh, PTSD, correct? Yes. Uh, exhibit 544 is in essence your diagnosis. You said that Jody Arias clearly falls under criteria A1, A2, B3, C3, C6. Well, there were two or three others that I had omitted on that sir, line. Sir, I'm just asking you to, to follow along. I'm reading and D3. Isn't that what it says? Yes. And so, sir, one of the things that we know is that in Exhibit 545 is that there, under each one of these sections, it indicates, for example, that there has to be, for example, D, there has to be two or more of the following, right, in order for the diagnosis to be confirmed, right? Yes. Um, and under C, it calls for three or more of the factors listed in there for, their, for the diagnosis to be confirmed, right? Yes. And you're looking at what appears to be your printout of the dsm 4 Diagnostic Criteria for PTSD, right? Yes. Let me show you this exhibit, which has already been marked. Is this a true and accurate depiction of what you have there and the diagnostic criteria for PTSD? Yes. And that's what you based your diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder uh, in this case, and that's what you told the jury that you did in response to their questions, right? Yes. I move for the admission of Exhibit 545. Yes. Section. Right. And uh, to talk about defining a post traumatic stress disorder, okay? 
Yes. And that's the one that requires two or more of five factors that are set out there, correct? Yes, and there are three. I'm not asking you that, am I? I know you want to jump the gun, but let's slow it down a little bit. You did say that you found D3, right? I did. D3 has to do with difficulty concentrating, right? Yes. And in fact, one of the things that we need to remember is that these factors, one through five, have to be present after the traumatic event, right? That's correct. That's why they call it post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Yes. Because if the factors were present before, then they wouldn't be part of the diagnosis. It wouldn't support the diagnosis, right? Which is a post-traumatic stress right. disorder. Right. So if the factors were present before the traumatic event, then they can't be counted, right? That's not necessarily true, but they were present at the time of my evaluation, so that's irrelevant. So you're saying, for example, let's talk about D1. Let's start with D1. One of the things that it indicates there is that this individual, one of the first factors is difficulty falling or staying asleep, right? Yes. And I've written it down. There it is. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. She didn't manifest that, did she? No, she did not. So that's a no. Number two, D2, talks about irritability or outbursts of anger, right? Yes. And you indicated to us, as to that one, that yeah, she did meet that one, right? Yes. And you told us that she met that one because of this sort of fighting with her mother, right? Yes. But isn't it true, sir, that you told us that you reviewed the corroborating data? Do you remember telling us that? I do. Isn't it true that in terms of her outbursts of anger with her mother, that had been present since her teenage years? Ah, but not to the degree that it yes began Yes or no? Could yes, you sir. repeat that? Can he answer the question? Not, it's not a yes or no. All right. The witness requested the question be restated or repeated, Mr. Martinez. With regard to this issue involving the uh, fighting with her mother, that was present, yes or no, from her teenage years, correct? Yes, to a lesser degree. Well, let's talk about that lesser degree. Let's take a look at three exhibits and see what that lesser degree is.
and read the highlighted portion. Okay, Jody. Okay. Oh, 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 no, no, to yourself. Oh, to myself. All right, and then put it down. Okay. And this is something that you're familiar with, right? Yes, I am. All right. Exhibit 555. Take a look at that, and I want you to read the highlighted portion also. Okay. And you're familiar with that, right? Yes. Exhibit number 556, take a look at this first. This is uh, 476 on the right, the number. Yes. And in fact, that's something that was in the journals, right? Yes. And you read it in the journals, right? Yes. And same exhibit, 480 on the right. It's, it's page 480, take a look. What's there? This is page 480, correct? Yes. You've read that too, and you're familiar with that, right? Yes. And this is part of what you used when considering or evaluating this outburst that the defendant had on the telephone with her mother, right? Yes. Judge, she said she wanted to approach you. All right, please approach.
Sir, with regard to some of the information that you have, isn't it true that you had information that when the defendant was a teenager, which is before this happened, uh, June 4th, 2008, right? That was conduct before June 4th of 2008 when she was a teenager, right? Yes. Okay, when she was a teenager, isn't it true that the defendant had such anger towards her mother, Sandy, that she treated her like crap? Yes. And isn't it true that they argued all the time, right? Yes. And isn't it true that during that time, the defendant hit Sandy for no reason, right? Yes. And this was all before this June 4th, 2008 incident, right? But it's irrelevant to the uh, diagnosis. Am I asking you that? Isn't it before? Well, it's before, but it's not relevant. But. I know you say it's not relevant, but D does say, sir, persistent symptoms of increased arousal not present before the trauma. Doesn't it say that? Yes. And as indicated by two or more of the following. On a Correct. separate occasion. Judge, you have a question. You have a question. Yes, you may approach. And sir, with regard to the move from uh, Phoenix to California, that was sometime in April of uh, 2008, right? Yes. She was no longer a teenager there, was she? No. And in that instance, there was a circumstance when, as you read her journal, and you told us you read her journal, the defendant's mother, Sandy, came out here to help her with the move to Wairika, right? Yes. And during that time, Jody got very upset and yelled at Sandy, right? Yes. And isn't it true that the defendant and Sandy never got along, right? Correct. And Jody, or the defendant, was always mean to Sandy, and no one knows why, right? Correct. So, sir, I know what you indicated was to you an important factor here was that there was this telephone call that was made after June 4th of 2008, correct? Well, from what I understand, there were several. All right, several telephone calls that were made after June 4th of 2008, right? Yes. You never heard a recording of those calls, right? No, I did not. Those were related to you by the defendant, right? Yes. And this is the person that lied to, to the police initially, you know that, right? And said she was never at the scene, right? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your objection. Relevant. Overruled. And this is the same person that filled out the PDS and gave misinformation uh, as to the triggering event, right? Correct. So if you take a look at that, then all you have are three telephone calls, and yet you have other people saying that there were these issues involving the defendant and her mother, right? We discussed that at great length, and it was made clear to me that the focus of her anger and the intensity of her anger were elevated. But I might point out to you that that's one of three criteria that I selected. Right. I understand there's one of three criteria, and, and, and we're going to get to the others. But additionally, uh, isn't it true that at some point, one of the times that they were together, they were sitting down for dinner or something, and isn't it true that the defendant got mad and kicked Sandy? Objection. 
for no reason. Previous objection. Overruled. Correct? I read that, yes. For no reason, right? Well, that's what it says, yes. Yeah. And you, you are looking at this, and you're saying that you're the person that um, used this as part of your evaluation, right? Yes, I did. And so with regard to that, what you're saying is that, well, you're going to believe, as part of your evaluation, three telephone calls that were made after June 4th, and you're going to disregard an event that happened in April of 2008 and disregard this long-standing bad relationship where the defendant was yelling at her mother in finding irritability and outbursts of anger, right? Overruled. You mean? Said three calls, right? When coming up with um, a criteria Sir, by criteria. How many calls? How many calls? That was the issue there. How many calls? They were several calls. How many is several? I don't know how many several. All I right, didn't count then. the calls, and it wasn't revealed to me. Okay. But there was a pattern of anger that became focused and more atten intense according to what was told to me by Ms. Arias. I was fully aware of her difficulties in her relationship with her mother previously. But I believe that the elevation of the intensity of her anger by her report qualified for that diagnosis. And you say that you believe it because you're the one that's making the judgment that whatever these events were before, in your judgment, it's a judgment call, those do not supersede these several telephone calls for a finding of irritability or outbursts of anger, right? In my clinical judgment. Yes or no? That's what I can't believe. answer that yes or no, sir. All right, sir, we'll move on. Yes. Before Ms. Martinez moves on. Yes, you may answer the question. You may finish your, que your answer. When one applies the techniques of criteria analysis, you take every piece of information that was given to you. In my case, I use 35 years of experience diagnosing hundreds of cases of post-traumatic stress disorder took into account the fact that certain characteristics may have predated the trauma. However, according to the report of Ms. Arias, her anger towards her mother became more focused and more intense as a result of her incarceration. Now, we don't know for sure whether she was more angry because she was incarcerated or whether this was a reaction to the trauma that she suffered. Nonetheless, the criteria was met and in my clinical judgment, I made that call, and I stand behind it. It was your judgment call, right? My That's clinical right. judgment, yes. Right. Even though you've just admitted now that the irritability issue could be uh, associated with her incarceration, right? The criteria exist at the time of the evaluation. I believe, based upon my discussions with her, and as a result right. of my numerous interviews, right. that it... Go ahead. I'm listening. That... There was an elevation of her anger and irritability towards her mother based upon her self-report. Right. And in this, again, goes back to her saying it, right? Self-reporting means she's saying it, right? Yes. You didn't get anybody else in the, of the population where she was living to corroborate that, right? Well, I, I couldn't I speak to the prisoners or... Sir, the third factor that we have under here, D3, uh, talks about difficulty concentrating, right? Yes. And you also found that one, right? Yes. And what do you base that on? I base that upon my 25 to 30 hours of interviews with Ms. Arias. I understand that specifically. Give me a specifics. Did you answer the question, Judge? You may continue. Are, Are you, you asking for one statement out of many? I'm asking for your specifics that show the defendant had difficulty concentrating. We discussed the area of concentration. It was pointed out to me that she was having difficulty concentrating by her report. When I delved into it deeper, it appeared to be a phenomenon that was occurring with frequency and regularity to make me believe that this was something that occurred post-trauma. We had numerous conversations about this. It was reported. I took my notes, and I drew a conclusion based upon the information that was available to me at the time. One example, just give me one example of her difficulty concentrating. 
I think she once told me that she was having difficulty reading because she right. couldn't focus and concentrate. So she told you she had difficulty reading. When she testified on cross-examination, do you know that she said that she had read the Book of Mormon from cover to back? Did you know that? Well, I wasn't. Did you know that? I was not privy to her testimony. Right. Well, she did testify that she read the book from front to cover and knew all about it. That's wonderful. But nonetheless, but she reported to me that she was having difficulty in her general reading. That was one example. There were, other re there were other examples as well. I would have to refer through my notes in order to find specific ones, but based upon my clinical judgment and my expertise and experience, she met that criteria. And you can bang on it all you want, and it's still your judgment, isn't it? Of course it's my judgment. So, to get back to it, your judgment is based on partly on the fact that she said she had trouble reading, right? Well, that was one factor, yes. And did you know that she also indicated that she read her journals from beginning to end? Did you know that? Prior Maybe to she did. She wrote them. They were familiar to her. Right. So the bottom line is when you say that she had trouble reading, she didn't indicate that to us in cross-examination. And if that's the case, doesn't that call into doubt what you just told us? I don't believe so, because our conversations delved into many areas relating to concentration. Give me another area, then. Her ability, she indicated that her ability to concentrate and relax was um, impaired with, she was having difficulty concentrating on relaxing herself uh, in her jail cell and that she was not able to keep a train of thought on the, uh, the, the scenes that she was trying to create to relax. I believe that was something that she told me. And what you told us just now was that when she went back to her cell, she had trouble relaxing. That's what you're saying. She had trouble concentrating on images that would help her relax. And so you say that as difficulty concentrating, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So even though the one example that you gave us about reading, she indicated otherwise, you're still going to put your 35 years and your judgment and say that this factor was met, right? Yes. Let's talk about number four. Hypervigilance, right? Yes. What does that talk about, sir? That talks about a tendency to be hyper aware of your surroundings. Right. Is that, for example, being hypersensitive to the environment? It could. Is that, for example, being sensitive, if you will, to uh, what norm not normal, what people that aren't school say somebody is being paranoid? No. Uh, when they're worried about somebody snooping or looking at things? Mm, perhaps, but not doesn't meet, quite meet the diagnostic criteria. Well, no, pardon? It doesn't meet the definition. Did you find this one or not? That she was paranoid about no, no, her? No, that she was hypervigilant. I did find that, yes. And why is it that you found that she was hypervigilant? Because she reported to me that she was very sensitive to the noise in the prison. She was uh, aware of people moving around. Uh, she never had a problem sleeping. She was a very sound sleeper. And here, every little sound and noise would disturb her. There were other uh, elements as well. I'd have to go through my notes in order to find them. I thought you just told us that she didn't have any trouble sleeping. No, she told me that when she was, before this all happened, she was a very sound sleeper. But since coming to the jail environment, she had trouble sleeping. She was hypervigilant. She had disturbed sleep. Do you remember telling us, or me, uh, at an interview, that she told you that she indicated she had no trouble sleeping. I don't recall that. Specific. Well, let's go ahead and play it and see what you told us.
You hear yourself? Yes, but that wasn't one of the criteria I selected. I understand that, that you're saying that wasn't one of the criteria, but you did tell me that she wasn't having trouble sleeping, right? What I was saying to you is that because of her hypervigilance, she would be easily disturbed by sounds in the area, but that wasn't the only characteristic of hypervigilance. There were many. And I understand that, but one of the things that you specifically indicated was this lack of being able to sleep, right? Or having trouble sleeping, right? I said that her, the noise was troubling her sleep. She would be more alert. In the past, she told me that she could sleep through almost anything. Here, jail noises w woke her up. But in general, her sleep was fine. Right, and which is D1, right? She had no difficulty falling or staying asleep. That's what I said. Yes. So what other aspect... Other than the sleeping, what other aspect of hypervigilance did you find? She reported to me that she felt that her personal space needed to be left clear, that she would, be she would feel, in a sense, invaded when someone got too close to her. She reported that sometimes the sounds of the jail seemed louder than they should be, or the brightness of the lights were brighter than they normally would be. These are characteristics of hypervigilance, and putting together uh, with uh, other aspects of our conversation, I believe, from a clinical perspective, from my uh, experience diagnosing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, that she meets the criteria for hypervigilance. And with regard to the lights being uh, lighter than they should be, you just told me that was one of the, the things. The lights right? seemed very, very bright. bright to her. Right. Even though the lights were brighter than they should be, according to you, she didn't have any difficulty falling or staying asleep, though, right? That's correct. And even though the no noise was louder than it should have been, she didn't have any difficulty falling or staying asleep, right? We're not making that claim. Ms. characterizes your testimony in that small clip that was played. I, I don't think the question was with reference no. to that clip. So overall, you may answer. Sir? Could you repeat your question? You talked to us just now about the noise and that, some, and that the noise was something that... Uh, made her be hypervigilant, right? The noises of the jail, right? Not just at night, during the day as well. And during the day, she would hear noises, and that would make her hypervigilant, right? That was an example of being hypervigilant. Right, and even though these noises were going on during the day, and presumably at night, right? You did yes. say that, that the jail yes. was a noisy place, right? Yes. She still had no difficulty falling or staying asleep, according to you, right? That's correct. The last one under this criteria is exaggerated startle response, right? Yes. Did you find that, yes or no? No. So that's a no, right? Correct. So even though in light of what we talked about, and there has to be three of these, correct? No, two. Two of these. So even though we've, we've talked about these issues here, um, and there are two that you didn't find, you still say, based on your 35 years of experience, and having spoken with the defendant, correct? Correct. 
that even in light of what we talked about, you still find that this section D has been met, correct? Yes. Okay. There's also another section involved here, which is C, correct? Correct. And C, again, it requires three of uh, how many, sir, to find? Uh, three out of seven, but I found five. All right. Let's talk about C. And uh, let's talk about the last one first. The last one. Yes. And what does number seven talk about, sir? A sense of foreshortened future. Okay. And I think that you, well, I know you did, you testified that with regard to that, that issue involved her feelings of suicide, right? She had made, she indicated that she had, from the beginning, since this happened, when she became aware of what had gone on, she was planning to kill herself. Right, she was suicidal, right? Well, in varying intents, it means different things, but her plan was to eventually kill herself. And, sir, that's not a new thing for her, though, is it? Is it a new thing? Right. It's not something that, it's something that she thought of before, right? Um, she may have thought of it before, but this became an overwhelming thought and plan for her. She never feel, felt that she would be going to trial. She figured somehow she would be taking her life. And this is something that, again, in order to find this, we would have to find that this wasn't present before the trauma, right? Well, it doesn't mean that it couldn't have been thought of or verbalized earlier in her life. The fact is that this became a predominant thought in her, um, in her planning. She, this was brought up numerous times throughout her interview, and it was related to the time of the crime. And I didn't ask you that, did I? I asked you whether or not this trauma has to be pre cannot be present before the trauma. That's one of the requirements of it, right? Yes. And it does say persistent C reads, persistence, avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma and numbing of general responses, responsiveness not present before the trauma, right? Yes. And in fact, she made statements that she was going to commit suicide in high school, right? I believe so. And she also made statements that she was going to commit suicide to Matthew McCartney, right? Yes. And she also, in the journals we took a look at, and in fact, one of the questions from the, the jurors was involving these journals and whether or not um, it was, in, in your opinion, whether it was no big deal or negative, if you will, that she was talking about suicide. Do you remember that question from them? Yes. And so, not only from the teenage years over to Mr. McCartney, but then later on in 2008, is that when it was, 2007, she's talking about suicide, right? Yes. Those are three separate instances where she's talking about suicide, right? Yes, but the focus or, of the reasons why differed. I understand that the reasons may differ, but the effect is the same. When somebody wants to commit suicide, is they want to kill themselves, right? Yes. And you're saying that even though you had all of that before, you're saying that you still found this factor pursuant to your 35 years of experience, because in your judgment, those three other ones don't matter. The only one that matters are the ones that come after June 4th of 2008. All the information, all the information is taken into account, but this became an almost obsessional plan for her to do away with herself before a trial. And you're basing that on the defendant's statements, right? Well, yes, of course. And at no time when she was in the jail, was there ever any indication that she was on suicide watch, right? No, she never had a plan. Right. In other words, it wasn't there. You didn't find anything like that, right? No. So the only thing you really have to point that out to us is her word, right? Yes. Did she ever tell you that she undertook any steps to do it? No, she did not. Okay. Now, we also have another section under that, which is uh, C6. Let's talk about that. And 
What, do you, what does C6 refer to, sir? Restricted range of affect. For example, an Hold on, hold on, let me write it down. Is that also something called unable to have loving feelings? Is that what it says? That's given as an example. E goes, well, I'm just writing down what it said. And you found this one too, didn't you? I did find that, yes. All right, tell me what it is that she had that indicated to you that she had a restrict, restricted range of affect. In her conversations with me, she would frequently not show the kinds of emotions that we would normally expect to see when discussing such emotionally charged issues as the topics that we discussed. That is referred to as blunted affect or a restricted range of affect. And that range of emotions could include laughing, right? It could. It could include smiling, right? It could. It could include giggling, right? It could. In fact, it has to do, if you will, with the context and the response for the person in that context, correct? In a particular context, yes. Right. So, for example, you did review her conversations with this detective, didn't you? Yes. And in fact, at certain times, she's seen giggling in those interviews, isn't she? Yes. So, again, that's not a blunted affect, is it? The tendency to show a blunted affect can be situationally determined. In my conversations with her, for many of the times we talked about the specifics of the crime, her affect was not connected, was not tied in, did not modulate according to the content that I would expect someone who was involved in this way would react. And now you're imposing your standard. You're saying the way you would expect somebody to the react. The way a professional would expect someone to talk about the death of someone close was not followed through with an emotional response that we would normally expect to see in other clients discussing the same type of situation. And you're talking about somebody who killed somebody else or somebody who's had a loved one who died? Correct. Which one is it? Loved one who died or, or, or well, a killer it, talking about their killing? It doesn't matter because the, 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 um, the affect was blunted. And what causes the blunted affect is not pertinent to the diagnosis. What is important is the person's affect, their emotional state, their inability to express a range of emotions that one would consider, that a trained professional would consider to be appropriate for the discussion, the area under discussion. And you're such a trained official, right? Yes, uh, I am. I mean, expert, right? Yes. And one of the other things that you reviewed as part of uh, your investigation into this case is the unredacted interview of the defendant 48 hours, right? Yes. And through it, as she's sitting there, she's smiling, isn't she? When she's talked about certain things, for example, a Mr. A a involving Mr. Alexander. Yes, but that was before she admitted to what actually happened. Oh, so just because she was lying, it's okay to sort of smile at the lie? Is that what's going on here? No, I'm not saying she was lying either. I'm saying that she built up a defense mechanism to help her not deal with the emotional trauma of what re really happened. She created an alternative universe that she responded to. So it's not surprising that she could smile and laugh about this alternative uh, universe because it didn't actually exist. When but, talking about Mr. Alexander at a later time with me, she had blunted affect. With regard to this alternative universe that you're talking about, it's nothing more than a lie, right? In your words, sir. No, sir, I'm asking about you. Is it true that two individuals, based on everything that you know, is it true that two individuals came in and killed Mr. Alexander? Is that your understanding? Objection, yes, Judge. Yes, sir. Is that your understanding? No, that is not what happened. Well, it's not your understanding, right? In other words, it's based on what she told you, right? You weren't there. Well, it's my understanding. Right. And so what you're saying then is that because at that point, she was lying about it, then all this give and take with the reporter isn't indicative of anything other than that she's a better liar. I wouldn't characterize it as lying necessarily. Well, what would you characterize the fact that somebody tells an untruth? It could be a psychological defense mechanism to shield the person from dealing with the reality of what really happened. 
It could be. It almost, it, almost something that would occur in a, um, a dissociative identity disorder or multiple personality. But you didn't diagnose her with that. No, I did not. I rejected that. But right. nonetheless, it's possible for a person to believe in two realities, react one way to one reality, another way to another reality. I did not ultimately keep that diagnosis. So there's no need to talk about that diagnosis since you didn't keep it, right? I was using it as an example. Right, so. but it doesn't apply here, does it? No, it does not. So let's not talk about things that don't apply. Can we agree to that? Sure. So in this particular case, what we're talking about is a situation that you've reviewed all of these hours of conversations of, of her with the 48 hours people, and you saw her giggling, you saw her talking, and to you, that doesn't have any significance because later on, when she changed her mind, she did have some sort of reaction, right? I didn't say it had nothing to do with it. I'm just simply saying that her emotional capabilities were different from those two different versions, those two realities that she created. Well, she recreated an artificial reality. How about this, again, this blunted affect? Isn't it true that when she would call, for example, her relatives, isn't it true that she would giggle and she would laugh? I'm not privy to her conversations with her relatives. Well. You weren't privy to her conversation with her mother, were you? No. But you still talked about it, right? Yes. It's because you read about it, right? Yes. So let's, let's take a look at that. You've already admitted to us that in Exhibit 556, this is something that you considered uh, in your evaluation, correct? Yes. Well, why don't you take a look at page 478 at the upper top. I've highlighted it for you to see whether or not that refreshes your recollection about whether or not she would laugh when she would call relatives from jail. Yes, I see that. And you read this before, right? Yes. That's not a blunted affect to call from jail and laugh and giggle appropriately with a, a relative, is it? No. Objection absolutely. It's mischaracterizing giggling appropriately. Dr. Sainz has no knowledge to that. Overruled. The answer will stand. And Could you repeat? You still found this C6 factor, didn't you? Could you repeat that, what you, the last statement you made? In light of everything that we've talked about, you still find the C6 factor because you believe she had a blunted affect, right? Yes, dealing with certain issues, her affect is definitely blunted. Let's take a look at number five. Number five, um, what is fe number five to you? Feeling of detachment or estrangement from others. What are you talking about there? I'm talking about the fact that she reported to me often feeling that she was in a state of unreality, that she didn't feel tuned into the reality. She would feel, um, well, uh, to use the word, detached from the reality, almost looking at her reality as an observer. She also reported that her thinking was oftentimes foggy and unclear, and that she would uh, not be able to tune in to what was going on around her. This is a characteristic of psychological detachment. Well, but there's a modifier there, isn't there? From others, isn't that what it says? Detachment or estrangement from others, yes. Right, it's talking about interpersonal relationships, isn't it? Well, that's part of it, yes. Well, no, not part of it. Why don't you read the whole thing, and if you want, feeling, I'll show you. Feeling what? of detachment or estrangement from others. It doesn't say feeling of detachment or estrangement, does it? It says from others, right? That's correct. So what others was she feeling detached or estranged from? What, from, from? I don't want to, I'm asking specifically what others she felt estranged or detached from. She reported feeling different from the other cellmates, cellmates or other uh, individuals in the jail. And that was her world at that particular time. So she felt unable to relate to many of them. She also reported feeling 
this sense of fogginess and her, this inability to connect with people in the same way that she did beforehand. That's and what was reported. She'd never been in jail before, right? That's true. So it's not, in your experience, unusual for somebody who's in jail for the first time to have difficulty relating to others, right? It's possible, yes. Well, no, you have had 35 years of experience. You know that phenomenon, don't you? Yes. And so, in this case, it wouldn't be a stretch, would it, for her to have difficulty uh, dealing, or it wouldn't be a stretch for her to have feelings of detachment or estrangement from the other prisoners, right? It still meets the criteria. And that's based on your examination and your 35 years of experience, right? Correct. Let's talk about number four. Did you find this one too? I beg your pardon, how did, did you characterize that? Did you find this one too? Find that one too? Uh, no, I did not. So this is a no. If we take a look, for example, at exhibit number 544, it talks that you actually only found C3 and C6, right? Yes, I indicated that there was an omission typographically. And what you're saying is, is that it's somebody else's fault when this report came out, right? No, it was my fault. Oh, okay. It was my fault. I omitted typing in the number and the letter. Did you type it yourself or did you have a typist? Uh, some of it was typed by someone else, some of it I typed myself. So who, how do you know who typed this? Some of it I typed by myself and some was typed by somebody else. So Different sections. Some sections I would dictate and they were typed by someone else. In some sections I used my uh, dictation software and in other sections I would type it myself and take the pieces and put it together, revise it over and over again and somewhere I usually take responsibility for the final copy. However, I made an omission. And uh, with C3, what, what is that? Inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma. Inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma, right? Yes. And this is what you've been telling us is the amnesia, right? That would be, uh, yes, that would be an example of the amnesia. This is the dissociative amnesia that you've been talking about, right? Yes. This is the fog, right? No, this is the absence of memory. All right, so this doesn't have anything to do with the fog, even though the fog affected her ability to, re to recall things. Well, can we go into a discussion of amnesia or? No, in terms of the fog, did the fog restrict her ability to recall important aspects of the trauma? In the beginning and the end, yes. So they did affect her ability to recall important aspects of the trauma, right? Yes, but the amnesia was responsible for her lack of memory about the bulk of the period of time during which the trauma was occurring. And this finding, if you will, this that she had an issue remembering this, there is no scientific test that can be conducted uh, to determine whether or not a person actually had amnesia, right? Uh, well, they probably are, but not within the realm of this type of evaluation. Well, are you saying, for example, that somebody could hook up the defendant up to some sort of machine, and that machine could tell us whether or not she was actually, she actually experienced this loss? There, there might be a way of doing that with scanning and, and electrodes implanted in the brain, but as I said, it's not something that we could use as a practical tool these days. So these implanted uh, items had to be in at the time of the killing, right? No, you could test someone probably post-trauma as well. But as I said, what I'm talking about is, is experimental and not available to us at the time. So, so practically speaking, no. No. All right. So, and. There is nothing that we can, for example, look beyond her brain. There's no, no other area that we can look at to actually get a total assurance that what she is telling us is truthful, right? Right. So we can look, for example, at the uh, journals. We could look at them, right? Yes, we could. But again, that's a situation where your expertise would have to come in, right? Yes. Uh, we can look at, for example, conversations that she may have had with the media, right? Correct. And again, your expertise would have to be called in to determine whether or not she's able to recall this, right? Correct. I mean, you indicated that uh, this issue involving this PTSD 
was something like a crater. Do you remember talking about it? I did. And that the event was this anxiety, right? The, 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 um, the, the meteor that came in, right? That's right. But in that circumstance that we're talking about, the crater, people can actually go look at the crater, can't they? Uh, yes, that's correct. Sure. And we can go and we look and we can see that it's big and it's got an indentation in the earth, right? Correct. Whereas in this particular case, we, you can't look into her brain and find any indentation or any indication like that to show you whether or not she's actually telling the truth about this amnesia, right? That's the nature of psychology. I'm not asking you if that's the nature of psychology. I'm asking you about whether or not <laughs> as you sit there testifying, can you look over there and find such a key uh, uh, inside her brain that physically others could look at, I like the crater example. I can opine with respect to all reasonable psychological probability. So the answer would be no then, right? You cannot. I can, I can respond in terms of referring to all psychological probability. Which is basically telling me that you don't know, right? I don't think that's what I'm saying. Well, could, you, could you rephrase that perhaps? Sure, sir? we're talking about the crater. You indicated to me that somebody could go out to the crater and look at it, right? Correct. And that's the PTSD, right? That would be equivalent to the symptoms being presented sure. for PTSD. Right. If you look over at the defendant, there is no such crater, and I'm using that metaphorically speaking, there is no such crater there that would allow you to say, say to point it to it and say, see, there's the crater, that's why she had loss of memory, right? No, psychology is not that type of a right. science. And we're, in fact, we're, what that means is that in terms of this issue, whether it's dissociative amnesia, which you've talked to the jury about, uh, other questions or anything else, we're left at her, the mercy of her words, right? And other information picked up from the uh, ancillary materials that I reviewed. Right, the ancillary materials being the journals, right? The journals. 48 hours conversations, right? Yes. And text messages, all that sort of stuff, right? right? But again, you can't point to anything like the crater example, can you? No, there's a difference between geological science and the science of psychology. All right, so talk about two. What does number two talk about? It talks about efforts to avoid activities, places, or people that arouse recollections of the trauma. All right. Mr. Martinez, we're going to take the noon recess. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the designated area at 125. We will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Uh, yes, we are at recess. Council approach. Dr. Samuels, you may step down.